our laws as it pertains to substances are draconian and bizarre. The psychopaths start this way. He was an alcoholic. Because of social media and pornography, PTSD, love addiction, fentanyl and heroin, ridiculous <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a doctor for <laughs> sake. Where the hell you think I learned that? I'm just saying, you go to treatment before you kill people. I am a clinician. I observe things about these chemicals. Let's just deal with what's real. We used to get these calls on Loveline all the time. Educate adolescents and to prevent and to treat. If you have trouble, you can't stop and you want to help stop it, I can help. I got a lot to say. I got a lot more to say. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, we are watching you on the restream. And of course, we're out on Clubhouse as well, where we, where we will be taking your calls in a few minutes. Uh, if you do raise your hand, I'll bring you up to the podium and you'll be streaming on multiple platforms, including Twitch, Twitter. I don't know where else you guys are sending us. Rumble, uh, um, YouTube. We're out all over the place. So uh, it's almost like a broadcast. Uh, I'm looking at the schedule. We have a urologist. Tomorrow, we're going to have two very distinctly different shows today. Tomorrow, we have a urologist in here, Dr. Tapscott whom I've interviewed in the past. She is very, very interesting. And uh, during the show here, Caleb, I'm going to need you to, uh, to uh, send an email to Michelle Poe. I see she booked a show next Wednesday when I'll be in the air on my way to Austin, Texas. So tell her if she, I, she can make I that I thought Tuesday. that was unusual. I noticed that. <laughs> yes, so that would be good if we can uh, correct that. So uh, let me get all... Uh, I want to make sure I get Megan's particulars here. And here we go. The good, good interview that the good review that uh, Michelle in fact sent me. So Megan is a friend of mine. She's a host of the weekly interview podcast, The Unspeakable Podcast. Author of six books: uh, The Problem with Everything, My Journey Through the New Culture Wars. It's a New York Times notable book for 2019. We're going to talk about that. There it is in the full screen. I recommend it most highly. And it's in fact how I'll tell the story about how that connect that book connected Megan and I. Uh, she has a collection of original essays, The Unspeakable, and other subjects of discussion which won the 2015 Penn Center USA Award for Creative Nonfiction. She, um, in addition to the podcast, where again, she speaks to very interesting people uh, and really uh, really gets into it all. She, she raises the tough issues, and we'll get into that today as well. She also has writing workshops, including one in Los Angeles at the end of this month. She will talk about that. You can learn more at dom, D-A-U-M, masterclass.com, or also at Megan, M-E-G with an H-A-N, M-E-G-H-A-N, dot dom dot com d a u m megan welcome to the program hi drew there you are. great to be with you hey so let's quickly tell the story about the the problem with everything is it the trouble with everything the problem with everything problem. Um, how i yeah and you sent me a manuscript right <laughs> i think i sent you an advanced reader's copy yes the galley i did and and you were you sent this little note like you might find I think I thought you might find this interesting. And before that, I only knew you because you had written a positive op-ed in the LA Times about Adam Carolla. And he and for like 15 years he gloated about that. So talk about that for a second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I was a big fan of Loveline for forever. I listened to Loveline all through the 90s when I was in my 20s. So I was a big fan of both of you and Adam. And I loved Adam when he was on the radio. And this is ancient history now. But back in L.A. when he was hosting on on K-Rock, I guess, uh, I got very upset when Danny Bonaducci uh, joined him on the show. I can't remember. I think that was my beef. Anyway, I wrote a very, not only glowing, but I think um, sort of improbably intellectual uh, opinion piece about Adam and his particular um, genius. And uh, it, yeah, it, it was a little, it was it, a little surprising to people. And he put you on the Adam and Drew show to prove that there was a person attached to that article. That was so yes, funny. I don't know like, that he actually, because yeah. Jimmy Kimmel wrote to me and he said, well, Adam can't read, but if he could read the article, he would be thrilled. Or uh, we, we read it for him, something like that. Um, so it is so yeah, funny. It was very nice. There's, there's a, the, he was actually on um, Free FM, which was a 92.3 or something here in Los Angeles back then. He had a morning show and he was, he was actually syndicated around the country. And one of the most famous radio stories ever told came out of that. Uh, amongst the decisions they make there to put Danny Bonaducci in the seat across from him was one of them. But the other was he would, I don't know if you remember this, but he would bring in peers on one day a week uh, to donate their time just to do a little comedy with him. And um, for several weeks, he had three guys coming in there. 
And the management pulled them in and said, no, you can, why are you bringing these guys in? They, they, they are not good. They are not good. And they go, the, this first guy, he um, he talks about reality shows and talk shows and brings clips. I, I He won't ever amount to anything. You, you may know him. His name is Joel McHale. Uh, second guy, second guy uh, is weird. He's just weird. I don't understand why you think he's funny. Also a name you may have heard, uh, Zach Galifianakis. Galifianakis. <laughs> and the third guy they go, this guy is radio death. I mean, he is not funny. Why do you have him on? And another name you may have heard, his name was Louis C.K. These were the people oh, donating wow. their time to their morning show and they kicked them off the air because they weren't funny. So oh, wait, uh, you know, fantastic radio history. Yeah, Whatever radio executives funny? tell you, uh, do the opposite, right? Yes. Radio is a different thing. It's a different deal. But in any event, you, you read this book and I was sort of enraptured with it and I couldn't put it down. Uh, and we, we, I think I called you, we had coffee or something afterwards, sort of reconnected and, and, and I was, because it spoke to my experience uh, as a, as when I was in college and high school and stuff, it, it was all so familiar and it felt like it was a million miles away from the present moment. And let me just say as a sidebar, in case I forget, you'll be happy to know that love lines under full assault right now. It's a, uh, it's creepy. It's, they were making fun of people. They, they seem not to understand what we were doing. What? Yeah, they seem Love not life? to understand, not to understand what we were doing at all. So I can some maybe I'll do a whole history of the show sometime on one of these streams. But we're under full attack right now. So good times, good times. Good times. Well, I guess uh, so, you know you've made it. Yeah. Well, yeah. I've been attacked on so many things. So talk about so talk about uh, the problem with everything and 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 why it got you in trouble, <laughs> which was astonishing. Oh, well, um, I mean, it, it, it's called the problem with everything. It, you know, originally I wanted the title to be "Woke Me When It's Over," um, but uh, that um, you know we, we decided to go with the problem with everything. It's about it's really a self interrogation. So I started thinking about a lot of these culture war issues. Back in 2014, 2015, thereabouts, you know, and I've been writing controversial, kind of counterintuitive, essayistic kinds of pieces my whole career since the early 90s, since I was listening to Loveline throughout the 90s, back when you could be, you know, there was a sense of shared irony among the public and that you, you know, you could be pretty safe to assume that people sort of got what you were trying to do, uh, that your audience understood yes. you. So, um, you know, I had a kind of career and I would write these sorts of things and it would, you know, sometimes make people mad, but a lot of people appreciated what I was doing. And uh, I started noticing suddenly that it wasn't okay to do those things. You were supposed to be, instead of surprising your audience, pandering to your audience. Um, and I especially noticed it when it came to like issues around women and feminism and sexual consent and just kind of the idea that um, there was some sort of massively oppressive patriarchy, um, sort of ruining women's lives everywhere. And, you know, this corresponded with the rise of a lot of digital media and a lot of women's media and Jezebel and all, the, all of these, you know, kinds of websites where suddenly the currency was in a kind of victimhood and it was the absolute opposite of everything that I had experienced as a kid, as a teenager, as a young woman. Um, and I was just sort of curious as to what had changed. So I wrote the problem with everything initially to talk only about feminism, but then it became about broader cultural issues. Yeah, you were you were interrogating your experience of third wave feminism, essentially, of which you were a yeah. leader, you were a voice, you were a voice of it. And you yeah. were sort of curious as how it went from sort of feeling that you could compete with your male peers as well as or better. In fact, you were sort of given a little bit better. of a, a nudge. Like, yeah, yeah, it was the, it was sort of the power puff years, you know, the women are better, they're they're cool, they're better and men are sort of mm. Um, uh, and, uh, and I remember welcoming that. I remember, in fact, in fact, um, interesting. I mean, it kind of, I haven't thought about it, but it sort of led to our present moment in an interesting way, because if you look at, um, the, the positions of authority, they're mostly filled by women. It seems like to me, I mean, they're everywhere. And so it was that, it was that spirit that set the present moment up. So why would you undermine that? It was very odd. Yeah. I mean, I think there's a lot of 
there's a lot of moving pieces here. And, you know, obviously if, if, if your measure of power and success is being the CEO of a fortune 500 company, yes, there are more men in those roles. And we can talk about the reasons for that if anybody's interested, but yeah, on the whole, women are getting higher education at a much higher rate. We're graduating from college. We're going to law school. I think, I think women, uh, graduate from medical school at a slightly higher rate than men. You know, they're across any number yep. of metrics, women are doing yep. better. Um, so I was just uh, kind of puzzled as to why suddenly there was this obsession with toxic masculinity and mansplaining and, you know, the, the idea that men were like taking up too much room, sitting on a subway seat was an occasion for a thousand think pieces that would, you know, be, uh, be, be, received as the most you know brave it's stunning and brave uh, insight into the into the human condition so anyway the right. the book came out of that and um you know it's it really shouldn't be controversial at all the funny thing drew is it's actually probably the least controversial book i have ever written it's it's much more um it's much more circumspect i mean i definitely um am very careful in this book in a way that i haven't been in the past and my Previous books were absolutely adored by a lot of the people who hate this book, and um, it's it's a strange thing to observe. Yeah, I I thought your book was exactly it was circumspect in the sense that it was it was self referential, and you were just literally analyzing what your experience was. You were not prescriptive. You were not attacking the present moment. You were just sort of curiously examining the the past. So back to more men in the uh, Fortune 500 offices. Whenever I, whenever I as a, as a physician, hear you know females make less than men in all positions and stuff, I, and they and then they'll report that female physicians make less than male physicians, and I and I go, what? It's not like there's a different reimbursement. We get what the insurance company pay us. We get what the Medicare pays us. It's not there's a women doctor and a male doctor reimbursement rate we get what we we just fill out the form and you get back what you did that's it and if you right. do less you get paid less and if you're doing less I, there must be a reason for that I, I don't know but it's up to you to decide to do more or do less because you get you just get paid a rate it's just a rate that the insurance companies and medicare reimburses why did why doesn't anybody ever sort of bring that up well, I mean, but it also has to do with specialties, right? So if, I mean, a primary care physician isn't going to get paid as much as a cardiologist probably. So, I mean, yep. I'm curious actually okay. what you would say to that. I mean, the fact is a lot of women choose careers. Let's just take medicine. I mean, a lot of women choose to go into pediatrics or primary care because, because if they want to have families, they know that there's more flexibility there. The trade-off is that it pays less. Um, if you are a surgeon and need to be on call around the clock and have an incredibly stressful career, it's going to be a lot harder for you to take off, you know, a, a maternity leave or two or three. And so, you know, I always say, uh, you know, Mother Nature is the ultimate misogynist, right? Mm, <laughs> the reason for the gender That's pay gap, the gender pay gap is a motherhood penalty, right? That's what yeah. it is. So Women who don't so have children we, don't make any less yeah. than men do. That's so. So should we support that? Compensate that? I, what do we do with that? I don't know. You know, I have heard um, people sort of float the idea of, of reparations for for women. I mean, I don't like like most forms of reparations. I don't see how that could work. But it's an interesting thing to to think about. You know, I I I don't have children myself, and that is a choice. I'm, a, I'm an outlier there. Most people do want kids and they have them if they're lucky, but I just happen to not be wired in that way. And it makes my life a lot easier. And, um, you know, I have to admit, I sometimes have to have to check myself because I think I have been guilty of making assumptions about how easy things are for women and you know all these all these things you're complaining about they're not really that big that's because i have a you know a, a little bit of a of a blinkered lens there because i'm i don't have kids so i have tried to be more mindful of that but yeah i mean most yeah. of the ways that women get held back are because we're the ones that have to go on maternity leave and lactate and really really make big sacrifices right i th that is absolutely true and i've always felt we should be 
figuring out a way to support that or or you know i or whether you know maybe it's more about returning to work after you know taking time out for child rearing that that is more supported or more encouraged or, or something so people don't yeah. feel like they can't return at the same level or can't or they're left behind by their male peers who didn't take that time off Th that to me that always seemed like a one way to try to solve that yeah i mean i've written about this i'm very much in favor again in theory of universal daycare you know i don't have a any dog in that fight but uh i i yeah, do that, think that that, that though again, how would it work? Th that, that though is a is a that is a a little bit of a straw dog in the sense that what what people don't realize before they have kids is what kids do to moms and what moms feel about that uh, it, it is you know we can override that basic biology if you want but it is profound and i always say if children like put a, t a hose into women and just suck their soul out and dad cannot substitute no matter how much he tries the child will still do that that download from the mom it come you know it's much like lactating but as an emotional kind of pull like that that goes on for a few years per child and then women when they're away from a child feel an immense sense of loss and guilt and wanting to be with and they can again they can override it but to pretend it's not there is is because motivational states move people in a certain direction so just having those motivational states are going to move people away from using the universal daycare you know what i'm saying yeah no i exactly yeah, i mean i i don't think it would hurt to have the universal daycare there but you're right absolutely these things are are subtle they're very hard to quantify i mean you know i'm always kind of amused because you know women talk about you know their their husband maybe their husbands are doing half the work or they're doing the child care but it's never quite right you know like he doesn't know how yeah. to pack the lunch exactly the right way or he doesn't it, it's not with the other it's not even about it's, it's not even it, it's not about the skill set it, it, although that's part of it it's the it's the it's the connectedness it's the connection it's the attachment uh, the attachment yeah. is profound and with the attachment comes attunement and we don't we we have to work very hard at attunement and some of us are better some of us not but we're not wired up with the large corpus callosum that allows us to have that kind of attunement we have to really work at it and i would argue have a lot of therapy to be able to do it so it's 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 a really challenging issue and we have to think long and hard about whether or not we want to override that biology I mean, what are we doing by overriding them? Why might we be doing something in doing so? Um, I so I don't know. I, and everyone always, yeah, can you even override? It's an interesting question. Interesting question. So, um, so the book was received sort of not great. I mean, it was by people that you usually <laughs> are accustomed to being being celebrated by. What was that like? What, what was the reception? You know <laughs> well, it got a good review in the New York Times. It got some nice reviews. Um, you know, yeah. there were some, it's funny because, you know, I, the book is a self-interrogation, right? So at one point I say in the book, um, you know, I'm sort of ruminating, like, is there something that I'm missing when these, these young women are complaining about feeling like victims? Like, is there something I'm not getting? Um, you know, am, am I just doing some version of get off my lawn? Like, it's all part of this kind of, um, you know, musing. And uh, the New Yorker ran a, a review, a pretty negative review of the book. And the, the headline was, Megan Dom says, millennials, get off my lawn. Now, <laughs> right. <laughs> obviously, right. that's a very, that's an amusing headline, as was the, um, I talk a lot about gen, Generation X culture. Uh, in the book and Alanis Morissette and such. And there was another headline that was Jagged Little Red Pill. That that was good too. <laughs> That's a, I like that um, one. I like that one. Yeah, worth it. The, the negative <laughs> review was worth it for the brilliant headline. Um, yeah. Yeah, I just, I think that um, a, a lot of people are just on a, on a trip wire now. And if they think that you're saying a couple of things that don't sit right with them, they're going to put you in the lane of people who say, you know, everything terrible. It's people cannot take an yeah. a la carte approach to ideas. You're either in one lane or the other one and you choose. Well, we, we've gotten into this mode where people are, it, it's Adam had this whole analogy about roommates. He said, it's like, it's like you are, there are two roommates and the, 
the uh, landlord has to decide who's going to stay because one of you's got to go. And the one roommate has been cleaning the place and doing the dishes and paying the rent and making sure electricity is paid on time. And the other one has been sitting playing video games. He's been a mess. He hasn't done anything. He hasn't been working. And then when it comes time to make the appeal, the roommate that is the slacker starts going, hey, that guy yelled at me. And, and I saw him I saw him talk to a woman, nasty. And he's. I think he's a racist. And that, so they start vilifying. When you don't have an argument, you just ad hominem vilify the person. And that has become an adaptive strategy that people just use constantly. And so it's yeah. it's almost, it's certainly where cognitive dissonance kicks in, where people don't like the argument you're offering. They'll start go to the ad hominem thing. But there's even a bigger thing afoot here, I think, which is if you can make somebody a big enough villain, you're a bigger hero for attacking them. Yeah. So it, it's right. this is the guillotines again. This is this is French Revolution stuff. This is what went on in 1790. We're just bringing out the guillotines and it's cancel culture and it's all we're heroes, but be careful. Uh, the, the heroes ended up on the guillotine in, in 1794 uh, and inevitably that kind of stuff happens. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I think that, yeah, I, I don't think this culture is sustainable. People are getting sick of it. I mean, more and more by the day. And, and I just want to go back to something you were saying earlier about kind of, you know, weaponizing grievance right? The whole mm -hmm. principle there with this sort of social justice culture is that you're punching up, right? You know, you're speaking truth to power. It's okay to sort of beat somebody up, drag them, accuse them of things if they have more power than you. And however you measure power, I don't know, Twitter followers, money, mm. fame, whatever mm. it is. Now, going back to the, the feminism piece, I was really struck by the way in these sort of media circles and in this culture, it was complaining about men and calling them all sorts of names and mocking them and ridiculing them. It was, uh, it, they would say, well, we're punching up. We're punching up to men. They have more power than we do. So therefore it's okay. Mm. Now, my problem with that was, you know, they don't necessarily have more power than you. You are effectively handing them the power by right. going around like this. And it was so well, and that was, counterproductive. And that was sort of your and that was your observation. I think that was sort of the conclusion of your book, right? You were like, we we, we the power was considered distributed and we fought it out. You 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 competed and that and you did great. Why why you didn't hand them more power and punch up, you just competed. Yeah, but like the idea that it's so, you know, oh, I can, you know, have a coffee mug that says I bathe in male tears or whatever it is. Like to me, that diminishes you as a woman. It, that You might as well be saying this guy has more power than I do and I'm going to, you know, s slam my fist right. on the desk. So I, I you know, frankly, right. like as a woman, I just found it, I, I continue to find it um, really offensive and it's just, it's infantilizing and we have so much more agency than that. Well, it's interesting you were the infantilizing. I, I thought people that argued in favor of what Will Smith did, in res, you know, as though he were somehow um, responding to the honor of uh, Jada Smith, that was I thought I thought that was about as infantilizing as you could put that relationship I, in terms of what position follow. she would be in. In that, yeah, I know I could not follow all the sort of you know ups and downs of that. Like there was like he was protecting her, but then he was protect like and then there was so there was something like, you know. People only only people of color are allowed to talk about this at all. I, I was just like, okay, I'm not even I'm not even going to talk about this. <laughs> there, I've got yeah, bigger fish yeah. to fry than Will Smith. <laughs> yeah, I, I would just say one thing about it. The only thing I don't know him, I don't know her. God bless them. I, I have no ill feelings toward them. But all I know is when you don't perceive normal behavior, normal public behavior, the relation between an audience and a performer, when those become violated, all of a sudden there's usually a really significant reason for that. Uh, and when I see people that have done stuff like this and the door is closed and I hear what's really going on, it's vastly more significant than press ever speculated or than you will ever know. And they're entitled to be completely confidential with that. Just just know there's always a lot going on. When, when Again, when, when normal, not just decorum, but normal boundaries are just blown apart, when they don't perceive the normal circumstance, you're on TV or it's the Academy Awards. That guy is a comedian. This is a, you're an audience member. That's a performer. When all that just, just evaporates, there's a reason. There's a reason. Yeah.
It does. It's yeah. and it's not that you're defending your wife's honor. And it's not that. No, I mean it's such so, a cliche, no. but it you know it, we everyone is fighting a battle that you cannot see, right? That's like yeah, the oldest cliche yeah. in the world, but it's really true. Tell me more about what you've been doing on the podcast. What kinds of revelations people will find if they go and look at the previous episodes? Hmm. What kinds of things have excited you? Who have you interviewed that's been really interesting? Well, I interviewed you twice, Drew. You've you were have been very interesting, and I in interviewed you and Paulina together um, in the last several yes, months here. Yeah. yeah, so I've and been. It's a weekly that. interview. Yeah, well, it was so fun to have you. So it's a weekly interview show, talking about complicated subjects. You know, there's a lot of um, podcasts out there that are sort of edgy and you know talking about the dangerous ideas and and all that kind of thing. And it it is in that mode. But my feeling, and my this has always been how I've approached journalism, how I've approached writing, everything. Nothing is off limits if you talk about it with enough precision and nuance. Like there, you know. So right. I have covered everything from, you know, the the COVID lab leak to you know to relationships to. Um, I always don't you always draw a blank. I've said numerous authors and scientists, and I know it's like I've done like eighty episodes. Well, and let's, I can't remember any of them. Let's. Yeah, I know. It's like what'd you have for breakfast? Like uh, I I, if, I have, <laughs> if I have the same thing, I can remember. But right. um, um, let's go back to the lab leak because because I think yeah. it's an interesting it's an interesting phenomenon from the standpoint of the inability to have civil conversation about what should be just common discourse <laughs> you know did where did this thing come from and it, you know si what does the science suggest what are the ideas here why was that slammed down because i when when dr fauci i remember the day he said yeah it might have come from a lab I, I remember that day and i thought oh everything's different today the, the, now we can we can say that Immediately after that, I had, I had conversations with peers, and even in this environment, where doctors were going, "Yeah, yeah." Back at the beginning, we prescribed tons of hydroxychloroquine. We didn't have anything else. Didn't hurt. Didn't probably didn't help. And we couldn't say that the day before. You literally couldn't even say what you did. Yeah. And what 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 was that? What was that hysteria? Or maybe you don't know. I, I just been trying to figure it out in retrospect. I'm starting to see a groundswell of anger against the lockdowns because people are looking back and going. Oh, well, that was unnecessary. That didn't do anything. What was that? A national yeah. lockdown or statewide lockdown? What? What was that? And I was saying it at the time. We we always use the infectious disease practice is quarantine of the sick people, not the well right. people. So what right. what was all that? I mean, we're going to be, it's going to take hundreds, a hundred years to figure that out. I mean, historians <laughs> of the future will maybe be able to answer some of that. You now, the lab leak taboo, I think a lot of that was because everybody wanted to distance themselves from Trump. So, you know, if if Trump was making noises like, you know, this was a conspiracy from China and, it, you know, they did this on purpose or, you know, he was just nobody wanted to be affiliated with that. I also think that people yeah. seem to forget a key distinction here. You know, just because you wonder if it was released from a lab, that doesn't mean you're suggesting that it was done on purpose. Like I, I still or, or that, think or that, that it was developed or is being developed right. for some you know, awful weapon. means. No, right. Right. I, right. I, I can easily like, understand. It was just a, they, they, here's what I, here's what I suspect. I suspect that they were doing research to help develop uh, plans for pandemic as they always funding, do. By the way. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Yes. That we were funding, we knew we were funding, and we'd funded in multiple places. We might find out we were funding some of the stuff in the Ukraine too, when when that all gets sor sorted out, and, and and we were normally doing it in labs that were five stories underground, but for some reason in in Wuhan we allowed it to happen in that lab, and it was a mistake. It was an error, and it got out, and that that's that. And what, what more are we going to do with this? Why is that? Why was that a a a you're right about it being the word taboo is a great word to apply to it and and i and i think that literally anything associated with trump became taboo and people oh, yeah. ran to the other side of the boat but they didn't just avoid the taboo they did the opposite regardless right. of yeah. they just stopped thinking they just did the opposite and and that feels like a lot of it but but taboo is an interesting word to attach to that whole phenomenon it behaved yeah. that way 
Yeah, I mean, Trump was just so chaotic. I never understood why he didn't decide to take credit for the vaccines. I mean, he should, he deserves credit. I mean, those, that was a remarkable feat developing those vaccines. And he could have spun this so differently, right? He could have said, we are yes. the American heroes. We have made these vaccines. Join me, heroes, in getting yourselves vaccinated. It, I'm going to do it. It, it, it may, <laughs> yeah. It's so weird. Been re it's so weird. That, it, it's so weird the things he didn't do, it, right? <laughs> he didn't disavow racists. He didn't disavow white supremacists. I mean, why? What's why? Just because somebody tells you to, is that why you don't? Maybe he's the same way. Somebody tells him to do it and he goes the other way just because you said so. Uh, it's so yeah. it's so weird. It was so much of that. I, I spent a lot of my time with the run up to him and during his presidency trying to like figure it out. Like what what are people responding to? What is this? How did this happen? <clears throat> what's he all about? Why, why doesn't he stop the nasty tweets? I, what's he getting out of yeah. that? What's his plan? Does, is there a plan? I, I, I It's you still mysterious to me. You have a, a, For him? a mental health diagnosis of Trump. Well, I, I mean, it's pretty easy, right? I mean, it's, I, <laughs> it's, I, but that what what here's my problem with that I don't know. is, uh, oh well, I mean, he's many, I mean, many, but everybody's a narcissist. Well, right, everybody's a narcissist. It, it's is the question always I was asked was was he a malignant narcissist? And malignant narcissists, their families don't want to be around them. And it seemed like his family wanted to be around him. Now, I don't know if that was real or not, but that was like, mm, maybe not malignant narcissism, but certainly narcissism for sure, of course. And then um, the other thing was hypomania. There's a lot of businessmen that sleep three and four hours a night and have limitless energy. That's hypomania. And it's adaptive. They use it. They're a lot of successful business people are hypomanic. And, and so I'm, these, so, so what I was trying to encourage people to, to not think necessarily pejoratively about these terms because it doesn't, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, you want a severe narcissist if it's a fighter pilot. You know what I mean? And uh, my favorite president was Teddy Roosevelt, and he was the exact same construct. He was a narcissist with hypomania. That's who he was. Uh, and so it, it's hard to, un, you know, to with, with these labels, it's hard to really do much. You know what I mean? It's just sort of characteristics yeah. of them. It doesn't explain so why fun. he didn't disavow certain. What's that? Yeah. They're so fun, the labels, what? though. It's like, it's like, you know, yeah, it's like astrology. Well, they're, they're, play around with these categories you know. <laughs> they may <laughs> they may help you understand things but but it doesn't help you understand why he didn't disavow things why he didn't promote the vaccines why it's just like that's mysterious i can't i can't understand any of that but know. you know he 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 the the persuasion world claims to understand what he was doing and persuasion is something i don't understand i don't understand it at all and so maybe there are people that study persuasion that uh could make sense of that i i just can't let's uh let's get a couple of calls in here we're, we're um i'm gonna get josh up here real quick uh Dr. Drew. hey josh you um you made me think something yesterday and i, and I want to thank you for this because i was i gave okay. you i gave you a reading assignment and i said go read shrink because it will teach you what psychoanalysis did to the american psychiatric and i looked you know? at it yeah i did look at but, it but, go ahead but hold on and then i thought oh my god uh, the post-structuralist have done the exact same thing to American academia. That the post, the, a psychoanalysis came out of Europe and it was essentially disavowed by the scientific community, except America grabbed onto it both hands for 50 years and it ruined psychiatry in America, ruined the state healthcare system, it ruined everything. The, the post-structuralist are French philosophers from the 1950s who I was listening to some French podcasts the other day. The French think they are ridiculous. They've had nothing to do with them for 75 years and thought they were, you know, Derrida and Chaucer and these guys are just ridiculous <laughs> and useless. And yet academia in America has grabbed onto them with both hands. So I just it's thought funny. that analogy was interesting. Yeah, I mean, I've heard you say that before and it makes me smile because of your enthusiasm, Dr. Drew. But um, I was going to say something else, but let's 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 keep on this because you mentioned Will Smith. And I think that, um, you know, we were saying or I was saying on Twitter to you that, you know, if, if actually you brought up the fact that Will Smith might be the post-structuralist that we've been looking for, except it's very difficult not to be fascist. So the slap is obviously uh, the problem. If he had done anything else but the slap, 
we might be saying, oh my God, Will Smith is our leader. He's going to lead us out of this mess. <laughs> well, that's interesting. So the, the idea is, and that's what Foucault, Foucault says in the <laughs> introduction to ant, into anti-Oedipus. He <laughs> says, go ahead, keep you going. know, and I, listen, I mean, he's not perfect, right? Well, but he, his point was, he hurt how can one be, you know, how can one be a revolutionary without being fascist himself? Right. So we've seen that where people say, right. you know, um, this is terrible, this is terrible. And then it's like, well, you're terrible too because you're right. it's right. too much. Yes, okay. The anti-fascist yes. is actually fascist. So yes. So and, hold on, hold on, stop right there. So I want to get Megan's opinion about that because this is <laughs> early in the there you are. Look at you've changed your mic and everything. Well, I'm being chased around my room by the sun. I'm sorry about this. It's you know, okay. Great. <laughs> right. So it's it like shattered an shattered your camera for a second behind me. Okay. <laughs> this will be interesting. It's an alien, Wait, the aliens have landed. Okay. Josh, Josh makes a great point, and it's one I rarely hear people say, which is what I used to see at the beginning of the this whole world we're in right now, is people de demanding intolerance in the name of tolerance. And and Josh is just saying generally, you know, uh, being being aggressively requiring people to be a certain thing is sort of fascistic. Uh, so what what do we do with that? I mean, we just have to. I think we just have to stay totally intellectually honest, stay calm, take the high road. Oh my gosh, I'm really sorry about this stuff going on in my. Well, you know what we can do. We can. Window. You know what I can okay. do. <laughs> it's okay. It's, Don't worry about it's not, it. It's not that bad. You, you've got, you've got, you've got a beam of light coming out of your head. Yeah, Susan so, likes no, this stuff. She, when, she sees, <laughs> when she sees beams and stuff, she thinks it's she thinks it's God Himself touching you. <laughs> you know, so, I know so. what it is. I'm about to make a really good point, and and, 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 G, and Jesus is coming to, to yes. Um, Can you just look, shut I your just shades. <laughs> No, they are. I, you know, they are. I, this is not my house that I usually live in. But oh my god. Okay, it's okay. It I'll, fine. After the break, I'll, okay. I'll fix it. It'll draw people. Um, yeah, I was gonna say I'll take a break after you make this great point. Okay, <laughs> make the point. What's the great point? I have a great point. Look, I just think. <laughs> well, about how you how road. you stay honest. Yeah, stay intellectually don't honest. Don't give them but, any but ammunition. Take... By, yeah, don't give them any ammunition by acting like a child. Don't act immature and bullyish on Twitter. Just be an adult. Be the adult in the room and light. And I, I have noticed, I have, no, <laughs> I have no, <laughs> I have noticed though that you have been able to navigate on your podcast. You, you have been careful to keep things right in the zone where you've not really been attacked and it may be uncomfortable mm -hmm. and they may want to attack you, but you always, and, and I consider that uh, middle ground. I mean, middle ground yeah. is where we should all be, right? I mean, essentially. Yeah, so I'm really, really careful on the podcast to be very precise, totally respectful, um, but also unapologetic. A lot of it has to do with finding the right guests. So, like, I, I do a lot of stuff about gender, for instance. Maybe we can talk about that after the break. Um, there's okay. youth transition, gender ideology. That stuff is radioactive. Everyone tells me not to talk about it. I have not gotten a single complaint that I take seriously, that should be taken seriously. Um, I think the conversations have been extraordinary on that. And that's because I find the people that I think talk about it in the right way. And that doesn't necessarily mean like the best known person talking about it. Um, right. I've had trans right. people themselves. I I've had so many different people about uh, talking about it. And um, I think it's been incredibly valuable. Who, who should they look for in the previous podcast as those interviews? Well, um, back in the fall, I did a three part series. You know, I was so paranoid about it that I thought I needed to do three shows in one week to kind of cover all the mm. bases. There's a journalist named Lisa Selen Davis, who is spectacular on this subject. She's the best, in my opinion. Nobody, the, the mainstream media will not publish her pieces, even though they're incredibly nuanced, balanced, well informed. She has a gender non conforming kid herself. Her interview with me was, I think, fantastic. Um, there's um, a trans man who is a clinician named Aaron Kimberly, who um, <clears throat> is very, very good, is um, very worried about, you know, youth transition moving too quickly, lack of exploratory therapy. But he, he's trans himself. 
Um, so I have those people on and I can't tell you how grateful audiences are for it. And, you know, it's funny. Those are the episodes. Maybe you have these two that they get like a ton of downloads, but not that many comments because people are mm. afraid. Right. So, I, oh, you know, they're secretly listening. So I, I have a term for that. And those are those are those are called not, not downloads, but downloads. You know what I mean? Ooh, the download. <laughs> They're being downloaded on the nice. down low. Yes. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. It, it, I'm glad to hear you're exploring it because my feeling always has been that the biggest failure of the the transgender community is my profession because these the doctors are doing surgeries and prescribing medication. And when you do surgeries and prescribe medication, it's for very very specific reasons and you must be able to select the right patient for the right treatment and it's not just one patient gets everything the same patient no matter what job can't even talk about it whatever it is it gets a treatment no every every patient is different and believe me this is not unusual in medicine addiction has the same problem where people get in these weird whenever look let me tell you something i've been in medicine long enough to tell you there's one profoundly problematic position that people who should be just serving the needs of the patient take when they say i have a holy mission i'm on a holy mission to eradicate pain pain is the fifth vital sign pain the pain is what the patient says it is 90 percent of the pain prescri prescribing is done in america by the 1990s they were on a holy mission there are people on holy missions for certain kinds of addiction treatment. There are people on holy missions for gender treatment. When, whenever people have a religious, not just people, clinicians especially, have a religious, and it might not be a fervor about it, and where they're on a mission to do something, run away, run away. It, it, it's, there, there is no, there is no, no one should have, a, a, you should want to eradicate tuberculosis, but you should be doing it in a sane, systematic way, not as a holy mission from God. It's not medicine. Yeah. And that's where we get into very problematic territory and hurt patients. It, it just is. Yeah. All right, listen, we're going to take a little break and we're going to let Megan deal with her um, beam from God. She looks like she's on a mission from God. We'll see. Susan's very, yeah, Susan's I know, very you know, interesting. You're fine. You're in my Nick, what do you mean? I'm on, I am on a mission. I'm, I, in the time <laughs> since we've been talking, right, well, I've been chosen. <laughs> you, <laughs> you have been chosen. You are the chosen. You can keep the beam in place if you wish, but I suspect Caleb yeah, will help you. It's a, a, a quick break and we, we'll be right back. Okay. Let me take a minute to tell you about Blue Mics. Over the two years we've been working with our friends at Blue Mics, the world has completely adapted to working and meeting virtually. So whether you know it or not, you probably spent a lot of time in front of a microphone. I'll take it from someone who has spent probably half my life on a microphone, sounding good is extremely important. And because of blue mics, I have never sounded better. But a good mic isn't just for broadcasting. Quality audio makes a big impact on whomever is listening on the other end, from coworkers to clients to friends. Clear sound can make all the difference. Thanks to blue mics, you don't need complicated or expensive equipment to get professional results. For simple plug-and-play setups, try Blue Mic's Yeti series. It plugs right into your USB port on your computer. Need something more robust? Blue's got an entire line of professional XLR mics, like the mouse or the Blueberry we use here in our studio, as well as the more compact Encore 300. I love it for clear quality sound when we travel. Bottom line, there is no excuse to be the one on the conference call who sounds like you're in a tunnel or underwater. I cannot say enough about Blue Mics, and once you try one, you will never go back. To take your audio to the next level, just go to drdrew.com slash blue. That is drdrew.com slash B-L-U-E. Back with Megan Tom, hey, Drew. Who looks like herself again. Hey, yes, Drew, yes, who told you to wear that jacket for the Blue Mike ad? Looked pretty uh, good, huh? So, yeah, yes, everyone likes it. Blue the... Mike is back, everybody, and they have new stuff out there. And Check it out. And Susan likes that uh, leather coat I know. that she I got like me for look. Christmas. I like it. You look, you look very... Um... I, I wear that at After Dark a fair bit, so yeah. uh, I'll keep doing that. So 
<laughs> look very, look very what? It looks good with the background. Look very. I got him that jacket for Christmas, so I'm very proud of myself. I'm yes. wondering what she's thinking. You looked very. Drew's like, you, you look sexy. I see. Okay. Right. <laughs> now I know she's. Sorry, am I am no. I sexually harassing this guy? No, on, no. on Now I know she's bullshitting. No, I know. So anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get what? I got to get a producer if they're flattering you like that. If that's the job, that's that's great. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm married yeah. to him, so I'm allowed to sexually harass him. I know. Him mm -hmm. I, 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 oh my God. <laughs> I not just encourage it. I beg for it. No, it looks really good, and and the blue mic, uh, the blue mics are amazing. So I wanted to really make it look good. Yeah. Uh, let's get some more phones going here. We're over on Clubhouse. If you want to raise your hand, I'll bring you up. Uh, Susan, do you have any questions before I get Keith up here? No, I'm good. I was running around trying to put uh, medicine cabinets in the back of our car because FedEx left them at the bottom of the hill again. Uh, I, uh, we just brought up 200 pounds of mirrors. Oh, my yeah. God. Yeah, they did it to the neighbor, too. Oh, my God. FedEx, well, doing a bad job. Anyways, go Keith, ahead. Keith, what's going on? Dr. Drew, Susan, Caleb, you all live and you're all sexy. You live, my friend. Well said. <laughs> I've got a COVID alarm story going off at our house last week. You want to hear it now or save me for the well, end? Well, first, first tell the I, I'm, I, I tell you a quick story about your mother-in-law. Oh, yeah. So my mother-in-law, this was a, several months ago, uh, she got COVID and was on day three. And we needed to get her Paxlovid as soon as possible. We've managed to get her a video visit the next day on day four. And I managed to pull a rabbit out of my hat in getting Paxlovid filled at a, pers at a uh, pharmacy about an hour away from home because Sacramento County had zero uh, doses sent to any of our retail pharmacies Which at that weird. time. Was, this was a strange thing. I, I had a patient nearly die because I couldn't get him the monoclonal antibody because he didn't have the right, <sighs> fit the check, didn't fit every check mark, even though he was he nearly died. And uh, Paxlovid yeah, was just yeah. not available. Just couldn't find it anywhere. And now there is a website. The CDC well, it's a little is a, bit of a different story now. Thankfully. Yeah, it's better. It's better. And I, I just talked to a guy, a patient, a physician today, and they're like, is it working on Omicron? I go, I Everything I hear suggests it is. So I, I hear it only working. So I'm, I'm, I think it's a good medicine. So, so what's the new panic? What's going Indeed. on? Indeed. Yeah. So last week, the COVID alarm went off at our house. I had opportunity to follow my own advice. Again, I'm 52, high risk, vaccinated and boosted as of October. Ten days ago, I got a sore throat. And then I got a runny nose the next day. And then the next day was chest congestion and cough. So I started rapid antigen testing at home, negative three days in a row. Mm. On day three, I got two PCR tests, mm. one freebie from my county and another one that I paid for from covidclinic.org. I paid $150 to get expedited results. Mm. I scheduled a video visit with my physician for the morning of day five. On day four, I learned that both PCRs were negative, so mm -hmm. I canceled my video visit. And on day five, I went to a Journey Toto concert in my town, <laughs> oh, and it was no. amazing. <laughs> now, had I been positive, I would have gotten a prescription for Paxlovid and had it filled at one of two pharmacies near my house because mm -hmm. I already confirmed ahead of time they had them on the shelf, and I would have missed the concert. Mm -hmm. But that's how it has to be done. And why isn't public health communicating this, Dr. Drew? I ask Every yeah, time I, I, I talk about so, this stuff, so yeah, it's so just, so Keith has educated himself and is really he's advocating for himself and his you family. You educated me. Well, thank you, but in a systematic way, how to manage COVID because no one is talking to patients. I mean, public health should be the way to manage COVID is to 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 educate the population how to manage the illness, how to do telehealth, what's available treatment wise, how to get how you should be testing. What to do if you're positive? I mean, the, do you, none of that information. In fact, quite the opposite. There's some a weird sort of um, again taboo against even talking about COVID treatment. I think it's an it's infrastructure so problem. But now it's good, and so why aren't they? It, it's everything's in pretty I mean, good shape right now. Why aren't they helping patients? You know, all all you see is. All you see is BA2 is looming, looming, looming. Looming yes. is the new <laughs> looming. looming is the new grim. Grim milestone. And grim milestone. Positive test. <clears throat> you have to have that positive test within five days <clears throat> of and you have to have the prescription and start the medicine I know. within five days of onset I, I, of symptoms. I, I, I so I the clock was ticking as soon I as I got my sore throat. I'm like, 
okay, yep. what's going on here? And, and by the way, thankfully it's I, just a poll. I feel strongly. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to predict that they will start allowing molnupiravir without the positive test, and they will use it, they will allow it as a prophylactic agent. So molnupiravir, my mm -hmm. bet is, is going to get more wide distribution. Paxlovid is a serious medication. It's three, two or three medicines in one, and um, it works like mm -hmm. hell. It works like crazy. Uh, but no one knows about it, and even physicians don't Why know about it. Why can't we just it. have it in our medicine cabinet? Well, for I've been saying since I, for a year that I wanted people to have moldopiravir in their medicine cabinet. There's no reason they should. They're going to have to change the emergency use authorizations I know, for that. I though. know, I know, I know, I know. But still, doctors can do that with their patients. If they, oh, it's a kitty. Meow. <laughs> yeah, they, she that's, agrees. That's, that's mine. <laughs> yeah. All right, Keith, you got to go feed yeah. the cat. All right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Dr. Friend. Drew and right, everyone. See All right, see you, buddy. Cheers. Yeah, that, that was the thing all during the COVID. I told the people that watched this stream, I felt like I was running like the French resistance. Like we were the French underground and we were trying to put out information about what's really going on, what you can do. And it was weird. It was so weird that we had to feel that way just by giving health information out. Isn't that yeah, weird? Most doctors still say that there is no treatment. I mean, right? They just say, oh, rest, there's, there's, take, there's, take. Advil, There's lots whatever. of treatment. There is lots of treatment, tons of treatment, and it's very effective. And and now you could argue that you don't want to be too aggressive with it. And you only want to use it over age 60 and things like that. I, I get that. But there is a lot of good treatment. And the monoclonal antibodies have been strangely restricted. And I understand the BA2 is not very effective, but it I, it's somewhat effective. And why we're restricting things or why physicians aren't grabbing on to these. You know, what I have seen, Megan, during this pandemic was the symptoms of the centralization of decision making in medicine. And medicine is not a bureaucratic endeavor. If you centralize decision making, it is horrible for patients. And that's exactly what happened here. It's terrible, terrible for patients. And what medicine was always practiced as high 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 levels of training and a motivated patient and you do you do that's the highest level of efficiency is the and i was i remember back in the 80s and 90s when regulation was starting to come in i kept saying send me back to met to more training i love training it was great if i if i don't know what i'm doing give me more training don't tell me what to do from illinois train me up so i can deliver the services you think i should be giving uh and it was all of course ridiculous but go ahead what were you going to say well, I just wanted to ask you, what is the deal with natural antibodies? This is another thing nobody talks about. If you had COVID, mm -hmm. are those mm -hmm. antibodies as good, if not better, than a vaccine, or are they worse? They are better, generally speaking. <laughs> the question is, do they no. last as long? Okay, here, here's, the, here's what I can tell you with absolute categorical certainty. We have no science on boostering people with hybrid immunity. In other words, if you've had the, the illness and the vaccine, we have zero science on what to do with you, zero. So, and that's a lot of people. Some people are estimating 50% of the country had Omicron and we vaccinated a lot of people and that's high, that's really solid hybrid immunity. So I, I have been splitting the difference with my patients. What I've been doing is saying, look, there's a good chance, certainly the vaccine piece of your hybrid immunity is going to wear off. It, it wears off. It takes, you know, four months, six months, a year. We're not really sure. But, you know, four to six months, the boosters certainly are wearing off. So if you're 75 years old and you've done very well with mRNA boosters, I generally say you should get that. You should get it. Because you're, you're after 75, you know, the probability of an 80-year-old dying compared to a 17-year-old is 5,000 times greater. 5,000 thousand times that in in biology that's an infinite number that's crazy and so you know i think those people need to really protect themselves now i have seen some very nasty vaccine reactions it, 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 and that's the other thing we're not allowed to talk about i've seen a lot of pot syndrome where people are passing out i think that's what probably happened to bob saget it might have been from the vaccine it might have been from the COVID. i don't know which because he had both we're not allowed to talk about it. I've seen people get severe long haul symptoms from the vaccine, severe, like really bad, really nasty. Um, you know, I, we're not allowed to talk about it. Wow. So are you going to give me permission okay. to talk about it, Megan? Yeah, I'll talk. Yeah. Talk about it on my show. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> come I, mean, on, come I, I don't, I, I, it just feels like we're living in the twilight zone. 
I mean, could you imagine 20 years ago, like if somebody had told you this is going to be where we're at and you cannot talk about these kinds of things, would you ever have believed it? I wouldn't have been able to understand what they were talking about. I, I, I literally would have been like, well, you mean in Russia or in China are you talking about? I mean, what? Right. And what? Where? How would they do that? How would that work? How, how would they how they prevent you from just giving basic information? And think about it. You know, you said 20 years ago. So 20 years ago, I was back still on Loveline, just giving out information, just giving it out. Now, non-experts would has no have no, people that don't know anything about the clinical circumstance or what we were doing have lots of notes about how we should be giving clinical information, lots of notes. And and that's a, a, another interesting thing. I, I was uh, talking, I was at a table with a bunch of um, sort of millennial age, smart, lovely, wonderful, you know, and um, they were talking about, it, probably the Will Smith thing generated the conversation. They were talking about open relationships. And I just said, you know, uh, it just, yeah, let me tell you somebody with 30 years of experience working in psychiatry, it it uh, it shit goes down when you do that. It it's hard enough to have a relationship between two people. You know, yeah, there's really. armies of people trying to help people do that. When you open the boundaries up, the feelings are unpredictable. You don't know. It destabilizes everything. You, it, it doesn't end well. And literally, what came back to me was like, well, Jill Smith has a podcast and she has a certificate in in interpersonal sexual health, and she says, and I thought, oh my god, oh my god, Th that's now, another thing that has happened here. <laughs> she has a no, certificate in like in polyamorous uh couples yeah. counseling well she, she, she couples counseling right uh, and it's like oh my goodness uh and i just thought oh you don't know the difference between somebody talking on a podcast with a sort of <laughs> well bachelor's level training and somebody with 30 years of experience at you know, double board certified, assistant professor, all this stuff. And you don't see the difference. That, that to me was just like, uh-oh. Oh. And, and I, it's easy to sort of put that as the de death of expertise, which there's plenty of reason yeah. that expertise should be under attack. I mean, we've seen expertise become adulterated during this whole pandemic, but this feels like something more. It feels like, like they just don't I, really understand. I know. I sometimes wonder if the polyamory thing is kind of a result of people not dating the way they used to like even in my time there wasn't a lot of dating around like you know you sort of you were people were serial monogamous right so yeah. i wonder sometimes yeah. if the poly thing is just some sort of attempt to recreate that the old-fashioned way of just dating lots of different people but with the sexual revolution yeah in our river yeah, window that's very and interesting bad, bad that, that, not a good a yeah <laughs> That seems know. like a viable explanation, but you know, I, no problem doing what you want to do, but but don't have kids in that environment because it's not going to be stable oh, enough yeah. for, for child rearing. It's just it's just not it's just it's not. That's why that more than no. anything, some of these provisions are to create stable environments for healthy child rearing. That's it's a lot of what what's is is involved here, and then helping people. Look, humans need a simple life. The more complicated you make it, the more chance, the more probability there is of uh, problem problems. It's it it just boils down to that. All right, uh, we have anybody in the uh, clubhouse room wants to raise their hand and come on up here. I'm happy to take your calls. I'm also uh, watching you guys on uh, uh, restream, and I'm laughing because um, Dunning Kruger has coming up, come up here, which is your right, Casey. That that is sort of I, I noticed Dunning. Do you know what Dunning, Dunning Kruger is? Of course. Yeah, I I, I noticed Dunning Kruger. Kruger. <laughs> I mean, yeah, I have them on I my show. I noticed it as there. Well, both of them do interviews. I've I've heard them on other I'm podcasts. Kidding. I know. Yeah. Uh, um, but the but that was one of the first symptoms I saw. It, let me think. When I first started seeing that emerge, it, it seems like it emerged l maybe leading up to Trump. Because uh, because that's when you really started seeing people believing they knew more than they did. Uh, and oh, then, you don't think then, it's a social then, media thing? You think it's a maybe Trump that's where it came from. Specific thing. Hmm. May, maybe. Well, yeah. no, I'm just thinking trying to put it in time. But you're right. Social media was probably the 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 arbiter of this. In or that like it, a YouTube thing. Led people. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, to believe that they had knowledge when they had just very superficial sort of understanding, and and just for the for the sake of conversation, the 
the way knowledge works, the way expertise works is you, you tend to go very quickly up. You have lots of confidence in what you know. Uh, you you plateau and then you go down and you realize you know nothing and you start feeling like you don't know anything and then you because as you learn how vast a topic is you realize you you really didn't know anything right. and then you come out of that slowly and that's where expertise is and when you come out of that I don't know anything because you've been exposed to the, the the vastness of a topic but and then you have experience with it and you build sort of wisdom and judgment around that topic and that's where expertise comes in. Oh, but do you feel like no. you know, I feel like I don't know anything anymore. I mean, but it's kind of like the imposter syndrome. Like if you, it, it, the people who, you know, the people who don't think they're imposters are the real imposters, I always think. Right. That's correct. Like, that I feel correct. like I don't know anything. Really? Right. I, I mean, it's. That's right. Pretty, and, and, and it is, I mean, it is in that. More. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> But but it is in those in ways you come out of the I don't know anything that's where you feel like the imposter. So Dunny Kruger is one end, the imposter is at the other end. The imposter syndrome is actually when you do know something is when you start feeling like an imposter. Yeah, I All guess right, so. All right, well, so it, Susan, anything? Yeah. To anything from Susan, your thoughts? You there? You busy? No, I'm good. I'm good. All right. Anything? On, Megan was but while you were out running around, Megan was talking about her participation and was third wave feminism, right? Or is it fourth wave? What, what the hell? Yeah, what, do you, what would you call you know, your third wave? Uh, you know, third wave feminism came around in the early nineties. It was actually coined by Rebecca Walker, Alice Walker's uh, daughter. Um, and that was sort mm. of the beginning of the intersectional feminism. But a lot of the feminism that I'm talking about in my book is actually what you might call fourth wave. And that's a lot of the social media stuff, the internet culture, the memes, you know, the ideas of toxic masculinity, just the kind of cleverness, um, that whole vernacular is a lot of what I was responding to in the book. So I would say more, more and, fourth, and, fourth wave. And Susan, in your, your, you, you were, so, you know, we're from a slightly different generation than Megan. Did you feel sort of put upon by the patriarchy? You actually were in, in the, in the persona of your father. Yeah. She wasn't allowed to go to college, things like yeah, that. Like yeah, like I had to oh. fight to go to college and my brother had a PhD. And then, you know, for years and years, he, you know, my my brother could do no wrong, but I knew oh all the problems he had. And I don't know, they I wasn't taken as seriously, but um, then I somehow prevailed. So, you know, I just got through it. It what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. I we guess. were talking earlier about, you know, how women are, uh, you know, when was, I don't want to say unfairly, but necessarily put upon by motherhood. Well, when I was, when I was raising Paulina, I, I, a lot of my daggers came out for her. You know, I taught her everything I could to not go through whatever I went through. Right, right. You know, <clears throat> I was willing to confront things like when Paulina was sexually harassed at school. I was like, I just don't want her to be here after hours at school. I want her to get in the car and go to the ice rink. Um, I was like, you know, you got to do something about this because it's no good. And then I got a phone call from the, the parent. They were just horribly mad at me. I was like, this, this isn't right. You know, and this was before the whole, you know, I, I just tried to teach Paulina that it wasn't, she would tell me everything, you know? So, so the, the point we were getting at was whether or not women are un, duly put upon by motherhood and how we support that because they're they're out for paternity oh. they're out for the child rearing there is no substitute for mom right how do, how do we deal with that right i mean talk to single moms you know you, oh my you God. can really understand yeah. but it's amazing what we what we put ourselves through and how we we nurture our kids even so, as so one of the mean things, as they can be <laughs> <laughs> one of the things we were talking about was whether or not we should be trying to encourage women to override their intense emotional desire to be home with the kid, a child um you know it's so funny because I, I was listening to Christina P you mm -hmm. know talk about how she's you know she's staying home with her kids while Tom tours like every city and every state like nonstop for like three months mm -hmm. and then you know she's just working her balls off trying to keep her kids and you know cool and mellow and happy and they're adorable okay they're two little toms bouncing off the walls you can just imagine but 
but she said something. She says, oh, woe is me. You know, I, I'm not equal. I have to stay home while my husband goes to work and just live in my fancy house and be happy. Like she was like, she had this like way of looking at it that I had never really seen. Like, you know, a lot of women are really kind of resentful because they can't be the one. I well, was a little resentful that be, I couldn't go out. But to be, be fair, she does go out and do stuff. It's not, she's like, doesn't have an empty life. She right. has a lot of stuff. But still. she's not, but, but that's like, that's such a healthy way of looking at it. You know, while the kids are little, you have to just do what you have to do. And, um, she doesn't get paid the same as he does. You know, he clearly is the boss and some women are resentful. I, I was a little resentful because you got to go, you know, be on a radio show every night and talk about sex while I was home and the kids were bouncing off the wall and I was trying to get them to go to sleep and doing God's work. But, um, and then making sure they got up early in the morning and, you that know, was me. with no sleep and you, well, I did it too. Okay. But you just, you get, yeah, you pitched in, you're a great parent. Pitcher. And I, I mean, a lot of people have said that you were not, but you were. So I was very fortunate for that as well. But I just think that, I mean, granted, a lot of guys are just jerks and we can't paint everybody that way because of those guys, you know? So yeah, I'm very middle of the road on the whole subject, you know? I mean, I want guys not to feel abandoned by women completely. I'm a feminist though, 100%. So, you use that word. You know. You're not shy away from that word, Susan. No, now. Uh -uh. Yeah, me neither. I know. Me neither. I, I know. Right. I, I, I've always been, and and I and I own it. So, but I also, I'm not, I'm not anti male. I, I want them to it's, flourish as well. I have two sons. It's such, yeah, it's such a testament to how quickly feminism moved forward, isn't it? To hear you say that your father didn't want you to go to college, your brother got a PhD. Right. And just, you know, within a couple of decades, we have more women going to college than men. I mean, it was so yeah. fast the way that moved. Yeah. And I think that um, I think that a lot of these younger kids now I do sound like get off my lawn, but I, I don't think they realize <laughs> just how it wasn't that long ago when things were radically different. No, you know, it was hard. You know, I think, you know, it was pretty this, hard. It takes time for for change to happen. Um, I didn't so take I the SATs like the SATs rolled around and nobody said, Hey, you got to take the SATs to go to college. Wow. And then my mom wanted Horrible. me to go to college when my dad, yeah. I went to beauty college. So I graduated early, went to beauty college. And then I put myself through college in, when I was 27, I just decided to do it. And I went to community college. I went to UCLA. I got it, got my degree in four years. Best thing I ever did. I was really glad I did. Cause I always wanted to go there. And then, you know, I, unfortunately I got pregnant like a year after I graduated, I probably would have gone to law school, but, um, you know, it worked out and I'm, I'm not, I mean, I think Drew realizes that he was always like, well, you should go to law school. And I'm like, I'm raising three kids. I can't go to law school and do this, you know, right. you, you have to like, have and your have priorities. Seven, seven kids and uh, be a Supreme court justice. So, you know, I just don't have it in me. I don't have it in me. How does she do that? Do we know? I, 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 I think of that. I know. It's always conservative and? women who can have a million kids. It's like the Phyllis Schlafly effect. You know, they can always have a million kids and raise them. And I, I think they make the older ones raise the younger ones. Well, that, yes. that that's old school, right? That could be, but they, but they all, oh, Caleb, do you say yes? Was that you? Yeah. I'm from a family. I'm the oldest from a family of five. We were homeschooled and, uh, I, that's why I'm so good with with my first baby is because I raised so many babies. <laughs> I was always wow. old. so the older yeah, kids. yeah the oldest kids uh, right. you help with all the younger kids and eventually even with the homeschooling situation you start to become the educator for the younger kids so you just kind of swap out with the mom yeah that, that's and that's I knew really families that had twelve sure. kids same exact thing <laughs> yeah that's how it works Drew well but well Megan's just educating me about this but but also I feel like <laughs> I feel we like through at the same time but I feel like the yeah. families that do that oftentimes have um super high value on appearances and are not necessarily emotionally attuned to the needs of the kids they're just you got to be perfect be a certain thing and um okay I'm not sure it's the greatest environment for kids but and everyone wear matching shirts make it work doesn't matter if it's you're 16 always, and the baby is a yeah. six months old. You got to all wear matching clothes. <laughs> it's like a South Park episode, dude. <laughs> yeah. Fascinating. 
or it, I was actually, yeah. And I was interested, like, yeah, I I've written about this, you know? Yeah. Women. I think also like women with a lot of kids, I thought it was really interesting the way Kamala Harris, they had to really emphasize that she was a stepmother. They didn't want to make her seem unrelatable because she wasn't a mother. And what I wanted to say is, you know, you want women to rise to these very, very high levels of achievement. You're going to see more and more of them that don't have kids at all. So, you know, yeah, it's a lot easier right. to get to that place if you're Kamala Harris with stepchildren than if you are somebody with, you know, raising their own kids and um, being a mom. Yeah. So let's get over Let's get over you know, putting place a huge premium on that. Years ago, I did a, a presentation in Washington, D.C. I forget where I was. The I don't know. Uh, but I shared the podium with a woman who'd written a book. And the book was originally to go out and interview the most successful women in America and see what they had in common. And she found only one thing. They didn't have kids and they were pissed. And they were pissed because they they were told they could have, I mean, it was Oprah, it was Diane Sawyer, it was all, all of them. And they all right. were told, when you're ready for fertility, you can do it. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll take care of it. And the time came and it was too late. And no one yeah. educated them, helped them, taught them that that was the case. At least now you can, there are ways to take control of your fertility. If you want to do that, you can freeze your eggs and things like that. Yeah. Um, but back then it was, they were being sold a bill of goods about that. That's so it, it's, it's improved. It's, it's better. What, what, what is going on with Kamala Harris? I, I don't understand what, what has happened to her. Do you have any insight? Um, I haven't paid that much attention, frankly. What, are you referring to something specifically? She's just her, kinda... her, the way she expresses herself. I mean, she was here as the attorney general, and then she was a sec senator from our state. And I saw her, you know, in various sort of settings where she seemed very um, capable and certainly able to express herself. And it just came to a crashing halt recently. I'm, I'm wondering what that is. I'm wondering if know, it's the, the fear the whole... that every yeah. Fear of nobody can speak in that White House. Well, he, you know, everybody's just so malapro. Like he can't, nobody can actually articulate anything. So maybe she's emulating her boss. She's sort of subconsciously yeah. mirroring him or something. I don't know. No, I don't think I, so. I, but I, 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 I think it's something to do, was, yeah. it has something to do with the fear of saying something wrong. I mean, everyone is so, as, as we were talking about, even to do your podcast, you have to be very, very cautious and deliberate and careful. And if you are also, you know, the vice president of the United States, the stakes would be a bit higher. Yeah. But I want to say, I think it would be so hard. I, I think that people like us, we're totally independent. I mean, I want to make clear, like I'm not, I'm careful with my guests, but I'm never careful about what we say. It's no holds barred. I never censor anybody. I never edit something out that would change somebody's meaning. I think it's more that you have to understand what you're trying to do with the conversation. You're trying to elevate it, not because not be gratuitously provocative. Um, but I, but the carefulness, you know, so many of us are independent agents. Now we have our own podcasts. We have our own YouTube channels. We're not answering to anybody, but our own audience. So when you've got somebody yeah. like, you know, a, a political figure, somebody in a corporation who's answering to a board of directors, a whole bunch of people, they're dealing with a whole bunch of other pressures that like you and I yeah. don't have to deal with you know i get very glib sometimes i'm like why don't you just speak up you know man up like yeah. state you know say your say your mind and don't worry about getting dragged on twitter well it's not that simple for everybody so that's why you and i should you just know what do it I, more yeah you're right i and i think i think that might be it i'm glad i asked about kamal harris i i feel like people that are uh, the the mobs are so dangerous the mob actions on social media and the mobs yeah. in reality are so dangerous that people in business people in politics are afraid to say anything and so they yeah. speak in gibberish they, they it, that's yeah. really interesting that the only people who are not speaking in gibberish are the people who are only beholden to their audience but that has another problem which is audience capture right so yeah. And we just end yeah. up in our silos. It's very hard to split the difference, but that's why we have to be vigilant and uh, wa and at the well, same time be honest. And it's why you, everyone here must spend some time with the Unspeakable Podcast. Also check out The Problem With Everything, my journey through the new culture wars. Megan, great oh, to see you. It. You're going to be out here. for want to, want to tell people where to go for your uh, writing symposium? Oh, yeah. So, yes, um, I teach uh, personal essay, memoir, and opinion workshops. I have one coming up in Los Angeles the weekend of May 
the weekend of April 30th, May 1st, very limited enrollment. But if you would like to apply, the deadline is coming up soon. That's dommasterclass.com, D-A-U-M masterclass.com. And um, check it out. So Well, maybe that's we'll that. have a chance to see you when you're out here. That would be great. All I'm right, Megan, thank here. you so much. Thank you. Great to oh, see you. Oh, you're here you, now? You're here in Los Angeles? Yeah, you're why here, do you think this nearby? light is chasing me around? Yeah, but what do you think the spaceship oh is coming God. from? This is um, well, from Los Angeles. <laughs> <laughs> coming yeah, the aliens are coming to get you. The was, LA aliens. dark in New York right now. Yeah. You know, I should. No, I'm, I should, should uh... I'm down the street. Right, I'm right, literally well, down well, the street from you. <laughs> I, I, can I, see I, you. I, I can't get that through my head. I keep thinking Should you're have in New just York. had to come over. I, yeah, I know. Exactly. Is actually moving toward your driveway. Now I can see it. <laughs> All right. Well, we're good. We're ready. We're ready for the rapture. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, Megan Dahl, everybody. Okay. Thanks so much, All Megan. Right, see you later. See you. Bye. All right. We got it. Susan. We got to go to dinner with Megan Dom. Yes. That'd that's, be fun. that's a must. I like uh, her. She's nice. Yeah. And, and Paulina's done some of her writing coaching and stuff like that. So she's a big fan. So, oh, nice. um, all right. Well, tomorrow we have Dr. Tapscott in here. We're going to think all things urological, and we get into it. I, I just I've done some interviews with her before, and she's very interesting with lots of things that people have questions about. It's sort of after darky a little bit. Well, she's a urologist, stuff. right? Yep. Okay, so it has to do with men mostly. Well, we talk a lot about. Well, it is mostly her main thing is implants and things, but but she does talk a lot about female hypoactive sexual desire and testosterone replacement. She's big, big into that stuff. Oh, uh, so, really? Yeah. So I want you to be here for that conversation. Oh so boy. Can, yes. Oh boy. Yeah, I was picking up a fifty-pound uh, mirror today and putting it in the back of the. No problem. Yeah. <laughs> no, my <laughs> shoulders are tweaked, but I did pick up a little more. Um, of my uh, medication, but you know what? Yeah, the drain's coming tomorrow, so they're gonna put the hot mop the bottoms of the shower. We're gonna put in the drains. I have a new ho housekeeping service coming. I'm gonna organize. We're gonna finish. Start really get ready to put the tiles in the bathroom. So you're looking forward to progress. Oh yeah, I'm totally. Uh -huh. I the good news about my dad not sending me to college <laughs> early was I worked in a hardware store yes. for several years yes. and I know how to build shit. But That's true, and you like it too, which is good. No, I do. I like decorating. I don't. I'm not a great decorator, but I'm. I love like ripping bathrooms to the walls, and I'm like whisk Chris. I like to just like. Redo it's nice seeing things take form. But our bathrooms were 40 years old. We have eight bathrooms. Oh, yeah. So Leopold warns us the hot mop is going to, the whole house is going to smell like tar. Yeah. Yeah. Are they doing both bathrooms? Can't, can't wait. Yeah. They're tarring both. Oh, boy. Oh, that should be lovely. Ooh, I don't know why they're doing that. I guess it, it works better than other stuff. But oh, they're yeah. Not, you wanna, oh, yeah. They're yeah. very small areas. It's only like like two by two foot. Oh, no. We got to waterproof it because that, that, oh, you can see the, bullshit that was in there before it sort of screwed <laughs> up the wood yeah this house yeah. was like you know mm. built by with sticks you know well I mean, no it was it, it, we've always, it, the we really admired the the bones of this thing but then they just put like mud on everything else it's they just, did cheap they did <laughs> cheap the work cheap. The, everything the cheap. was cheap but you know i was I, you know to build a house the size is mm. so expensive. Like yes. the wood alone, yes. you know, it's just crazy. Like, I don't know how. Well, now it'd be impossible. I mean, now the I know. Are ridiculous. I know. So I'm just cleaning it up and everything. Everybody's coming tomorrow. Plumber, Good. the hot right. mopper, I'm the ready. electricians, the, it's going to just be a busy day. All right. And I'm going to be on the trash Tuesday podcast. We're recording something when? Like tomorrow. Tomorrow. I, I think it'll, if it's Tuesday, it must be on next week. But anyway. So in any event, we will get Dr. Tapscott in here tomorrow, and uh, we will see you all at 3 o'clock tomorrow. Touch my heart. These are things called PDE5 inhibitors, right? When you're, do you know how you're, do you know how erections happen? Either you guys? Well, yeah, you, you look at it. No, I mean how they physiologically happen. <laughs> yeah, you got like this uh, carnivorous tissue, right? And then C Cavernous? No. Carnivorous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Carnivorous <laughs> tissue. Well done. Ask Dr. Drew is produced by Caleb Nation and Susan Pinsky. As a reminder, the discussions here are not a substitute for medical care, diagnosis, or treatment. This show is intended for educational and informational purposes only. I am a licensed physician, but I am not a replacement for your personal doctor, and I am not practicing medicine here. Always remember that our understanding of medicine and science is constantly evolving. 
Though my opinion is based on the information that is available to me today, some of the contents of this show could be outdated in the future. Be sure to check with trusted resources in case any of the information has been updated since this was published. If you or someone you know is in immediate danger, don't call me, call 911. If you're feeling hopeless or suicidal, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800 800- 273-8255. You can find more of my recommended organizations and helpful resources